We're going to be in Galatians chapter 6, heading down the home stretch in this chapter and in this sermon series. Our last sermon in this series will be next week. Today we're going to be looking at Galatians 6, verses 11 through 16. <clears throat> One of the things that I have, I have really come to value and appreciate about this congregation, about you, is that uh, there is uh, a great willingness here in this congregation to serve the body of Christ. There's a, a willingness here to get involved and really help with whatever the need might be. You all are willing to jump in and help to serve to meet that need, to serve the body of Christ, and to minister in the name of Christ. Well, one of the things I've noticed in addition to that over the years is that there's not just a willingness to serve, but I have observed in you a, an eagerness to serve. And in fact, once the work gets started, even an enjoyment in serving. And so I really have come to value that willingness and eagerness and enjoyment in ministering in the name of Christ. That, that's valuable to me to see that in you. I think when we serve, and so many of you do, it is important, at least every once in a while, to to think about what is the motive or what are the motives by which we serve the body of Christ? What motivates us to minister in the name of Christ? It's important to evaluate those motives at least every once in a while, and the passage we're going to look at today will give us an opportunity to evaluate motives in ministry. Paul's going to kind of pull back the curtains a little bit on these false teachers to to bring to light what is the motives by which they are ministering. Now, I'm not putting any of you or any of us in the camp of those heretical false teachers in terms of what they are teaching, but in terms of what is motivating them, we might find there is some, um, there's something we can learn along the way here. So let's, let's read our text. Let's see what the Lord has for us. We'll start in verse 11, Galatians chapter 6. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. There we go, get caught up here. For neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Typically we have three stopping off points through, through a text. This morning it will be five, but some of them we won't spend as much time on as others. So time-wise it should be about the same, but if you're thinking through, um, we're going to hit, uh, hit five stopping off points this morning. And the first one, just right here in verse 11, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but we see here Paul's personal seal of authentication placed upon this letter. Paul says, see with what large letters I'm writing you with my own hand. In Paul's day, it was fairly common practice for folks to use, like Paul, to use what we would basically call a secretary of sorts. To either write out the letter as it's being dictated, or to copy a letter that has been written. We know from scriptures Paul used one of these scribes or secretaries, and the issue would be, how would the recipient of the letter know it's actually from the person that it's, that it's claimed to be from? Correspondence in those days, it was handwritten correspondence. It had to travel over great distances. And so what safeguards were in place to make sure the letter I'm getting is from the person that it claims to be from? And there were several safeguards that they had, um, using a trusted courier, for example, certain personal details that would be in the letter. But then there were, there were also seals that could be placed upon a letter or within a letter to authenticate it as being from the person 
And so this letter is from Paul, and at this point, Paul takes over the pen, so to speak, and, and writes in his own hand the concluding part of this letter as a way of authenticating that this indeed is from him, that the words in this letter, the teaching in this letter, is from the Apostle Paul, and that's authenticated with Paul's unique handwriting. See, with what large letters I'm writing, that handwriting would, about, would have been identified as belonging to him. So, verse 11 shows us that this letter is indeed authentic to the Apostle Paul. There's a lot more we could say there, but for time's sake, I'll just leave it at that. So, verses 12 and 13, I'm going to put under the title of wrong ministry motives. Paul, as he brings this letter to a close, he turns his attention back once again to the false teachers. He points out the teaching. They, they, they compel you to be circumcised. If you want to read more about that, you can read Acts chapter 15, but, but you'll remember, because we've talked about it at length, that basically these false teachers who were known as the Judaizers, they were Jewish folks who were going to Gentile believers in Christ and saying, look, you can't call yourself the people of God. You can't say that you're in line to receive the promises of God unless you receive this, this particular mark on your body and unless you keep these laws and rules and regulations and feasts and festivals. You can believe in Christ, that's great, but if you want to be known as the people of God, in right relationship to God, receiving the promises of God, you have to keep these rules. You have to have this mark on your body. And of course, Paul has argued at length in this letter, well, if keeping the law reconciled you to God, if having a mark on your body marks you as, a, as the people of God, why did Christ ever need to come in the first place? You just, you just could have kept rules and got this mark. Why would he have even needed to come? Paul's argument has been, as you know, we are justified by faith in Christ alone. We are brought into right relationship with him by faith in Christ alone. That's how we stand in line to receive the inheritance that God has promised. It's through Christ, not by works, or not Christ plus works. It's just Christ. But Paul here, as he brings this letter to a close, really turns his attention not just to exposing the false teaching, which he's done at length in this letter, but to exposing the motives behind the teaching. And he points, I think, to... Okay, now I'm going to have to figure out how to fix this, so hold on just a second. <laughs> we got a new, uh, a new thing here. Okay, let's try this. Success. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to set this down gently and, move and, and back away. Okay. Two wrong ministry motives pointed out here by Paul. First, the motive of self-exaltation. Those who desire to make a good showing try to compel you to be circumcised. Why are they even preaching this and proclaiming this? Because they want to make a good showing in the flesh. In other words, they want people... I think particularly their Jewish counterparts, those, those pharisaical, legalistic folks back at the synagogue or back in the temple in Jerusalem to say, look how great this person is. Look at what they're doing. Look how good they're doing. Uh, it, it's this prideful desire to be glorified by others. Here's why Paul says they're compelling you to get this mark on your body. They want, they want people to look at them and say how great they are. They want to make a good showing in the flesh. Again, I'm not putting us in this category of the heretical false teachers, but the motive behind their false teaching can sometimes be the motive behind why we would minister in the name of Christ. A prideful self-exaltation. We would, we would minister so that people would look at us and say, well, look at him, or look at her, and look how good a job they're doing, and look at how hard she's working. And, and people may say those things, but is that our motive for serving? 
Is that what motivates us to minister in the name of Christ and to proclaim the name of Christ so that people will look at us? I'm telling you that if you serve the body of Christ, this monster of pride, you, you will come up against it. It will be there crouching at the door to some degree and in some way. Now, fortunately, Paul's given us the pathway to deal with it back in chapter 5. Paul says, I say walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. This, this desire, the desire for, for self-exaltation, that's a desire of the flesh. How do we battle against it? Yield to the Spirit. So we've got the biblical pathway to victory, but we would recognize this same thing that's motivating the false teachers just might be a wrong motive in our own hearts as we minister. We need to be mindful of that. Not only is there the wrong ministry motive of self-exaltation, we see here the motive of self-preservation. Verse 12, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Why are they proclaiming this Christ plus works version of salvation, which is no salvation at all, but why are they proclaiming it? So that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. In Paul's day, these, these Jewish folks who confessed Jesus as the Messiah and Him alone as their Savior, they faced intense persecution. The Jerusalem saints, these Jewish folks who confessed the name of Christ, faced intense persecution and were scattered abroad, losing everything. And I think these... Judaizers, these legalistic folks, they recognized that persecution would come. And so they, in order to lessen the persecution, said, you know, you know salvation, it's, it's not just in Christ alone. It's by doing all of these things. What's the motivation for proclaiming that? So that they wouldn't be persecuted. It reminds us, as we talked about several weeks ago, that the message of the cross is a stumbling block. It is an offense to the world around us and will put you and I at odds with the world. The message of the cross is that we are sinful people headed for destruction and judgment and the only way of escape is through the Lord Jesus Christ. By trusting in Him, His work accomplished on our behalf at the cross, but that message, which is so dear to the believer, is an offense to the world. And when, when we proclaim it, it will put us at odds with the world. So, so you will have noticed, as you minister in the name of Christ and proclaim the name of Christ, that you face ridicule and scorn. You may have noticed it in your own family. You may have noticed it at work. You may have noticed it at school. But the message of the cross puts you at odds with the world in such a way that you will face, in some degree or another, persecution by the world. And the temptation may just be to water down this message in such a way so as to lessen the persecution. We, we may minister in the name of Christ from self-exaltation, or we may be tempted to change things around to lessen persecution out of self-preservation. Either or both is a wrong motive for ministry, but we can see we probably all have faced these challenges at some time or another. We've all struggled with these wrong ministry motives. Paul points out in verse 13, I'll just keep it under the same category of wrong ministry motives, but he, he exposes some hypocrisy of the false teachers in verse 13. He says, those who are circumcised, and I think he's pointing specifically to these false teachers, who are coming in with this false teaching, those who are circumcised, they don't even keep the law themselves. Jesus points out in Matthew chapter 23, 
taking on the Pharisees, out of which these Judaizers come. He says, on, on the outside they appear to be righteous, but on the inside they are lawless. They have a rebellious heart. Isn't it interesting that the legalist who would say, okay, your relationship with God depends on you doing this, 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 and this. You keep this rule and this law and this law. Isn't it interesting that the legalist, if you could see into their heart, they probably found five ways around the law they're telling you to keep. The uh, Pharisees had, I don't know, 600 and some different laws. Many of them were designed to keep them from breaking the Sabbath or working on the Sabbath. They had one rule that determined the distance you could travel from your residence. Uh, whatever it was, two miles or whatever. I, I don't know what it was. But a, a determined amount that you could travel from your residence. Anything beyond that counted as work. You could, you could walk up to that point. Anything after was work. And... As the story goes, there were Pharisees who walked around with stools on their back, and they'd get to that distance that they could travel. They'd put a stool down and establish a resting place of residence, and then they could get up and travel the next two miles or whatever it was. They held these rules, but they were finding ways around them. They weren't keeping them in their own hearts and lives, and Paul points it out. They're compelling you to keep these laws that they themselves ultimately aren't keeping. And ultimately, you remember, Jesus points to the fulfillment of the law. And here's the big thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Were they keeping that law? telling you to keep all of these rules and they're not even keeping the law themselves. And then another hypocrisy of these false teachers is found at the end of verse 13. They desire to have you circumcised. They desire for you to put this mark on your body. Why? Because they care so much about your soul and shepherding you in a right way, in a right relationship with God? No. So that they may boast in your flesh. They appear to care about your salvation. This is what puts you in a right relationship with God. They appear to care about your salvation, but in reality, they only care about their own prideful desire. What people would say about them and, and how they could report back home. Well, we got these Gentiles to take this mark on their body, and we got these Gentiles to keep these rules and regulations. They, they were only showing... Uh, care for the people for what they could get out of them. You see that at times in churches today where they will appear to care about the people, but in reality they only care about what the people can do for them. Whether it's, well, our increases the attendance numbers or the offering numbers or the baptism numbers or whatever metric they're using and reporting back to their boards and their denominations. On the surface, it might look like they're caring about the people, but in reality, it's just caring about what the people can do for them. I was reading a, a report just, just this past week of a, of a mainline denomination who is reporting that by 2040, I think the date was, they would no longer exist as a denomination because people aren't coming and they'd no longer be financially solvent to keep the doors open. And they lift, listed out this uh, this strategic plan in order to get more people to come in. But when you read the plan, the motive behind it seemed to be we got to get these people coming in so we can be financially solvent again. Like, like running a business. The church isn't a business. We don't care about people just because of what they can give to us. We care about people because we want to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus tells of how there's joy in the presence of the angels. When? When church attendance is up. When offerings are up from one week to the next. When one sinner repents. Repents. 
Joy in the presence of the angels. And why is that joy there? Because the angels recognize God has done the work that only God can do. And we rejoice too at, at, at being able in some way to be a part of God using us to proclaim Christ to others and seeing God work in a person's life to make them a new creation in Christ. We love the church to be full. Absolutely. Absolutely or offerings, or whatever the number, that's great, but what motivates us to serve? Is it just serving people for what they can do for us? Paul points to the right ministry motive in verse 14. May it never be that I would boast except in one thing, and this is it, in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the false teachers, they were boasting in themselves. They were boasting in what they could get the Gentile believers to do. Paul says, none of that's worth bragging about. There's only one thing, and I think this points to what a right ministry motive is. It's to point people to Christ. It's to exalt Him. And in particular, I think there's two things emphasized in verse 14. This right ministry motive of exalting Christ, not self. Pointing people, first of all, to the work of Jesus. May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross represents the work that Christ did on our behalf. What is that work? At the cross, the penalty for sin is paid. The wrath of God against our sin is satisfied so that our sins are forgiven the sin debt that stood against us is canceled. We're no longer slaves. We're reconciled to God. Point people to the cross. Exalt Christ and the work He has done on our behalf. The right ministry motive. You know, there may be a lot of good things we get out of serving. You know, as we serve the body of Christ, it, there, there can be enjoyment and, and encouragement in the fellowship we share together as we work alongside one another. There's certainly transformation that comes along through that. Uh, there's a sense of, of, of satisfaction in using the gifts that God has given us to serve others. But ultimately, this is the motivation for ministry is to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. To the work of Jesus and then to the person of Jesus. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here we see Paul identifying who this Jesus is. He is Lord. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the promised one. The one that God promised to send to rescue us from our sin. So this is the right ministry motive, exalting Christ, pointing people to the work and to the person of Jesus. It's not pointing people to us, it's pointing people to Him. There are two realities found in verses 14 and 15. Two realities, I think, that caused Paul to say, I'm not boasting in, in anything but Christ and the cross of Christ. Two realities that would cause us to say the same thing. Reality number one is that the world has been caused to be crucified to me and I to the world. That in Christ, being made alive in Christ means that I have been put to death to the world and the world to me. So that what the world would boast about, what's the world boast about? Self, accomplishments, acquisitions. I've done this and I've got this and I've acquired this and look what I'm doing. What the world boasts about, that holds no meaning. That holds no attraction. Why? I've been caused to be crucified to the world and the world to me. Those things that used to motivate don't motivate any longer. Now, it still motivated the false teachers. Look at me, 
serving in such a way to be seen. But Paul's exalting Christ alone is rooted in this reality that the world has been caused to be crucified to me and I to the world. A second reality that causes us to exalt in Christ only is the flip side of being crucified to the world. That's being a new creation in Christ. Notice what Paul says in verse 15. Neither circumcision is anything, nor uncircumcision. Somebody that would go about boasting, I've got this particular mark, and that marks me as the people of God. Paul said, that doesn't count for anything. Or somebody that would boast saying, I didn't get that mark. I put it up here like this, whether boasting from legalism or liberty, that doesn't count for anything. Ultimately, what counts is being a new creation in Christ. That God has made me a new creature in Christ. We've had the scripture up on the screen, the slide throughout the service. Behold, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And because that is a reality and that is a truth, we will boast in Christ only. Because how does this new birth come about? It's through the work of Christ on my behalf. And God applying that work to my life and depositing His Spirit in me. So two twin realities. I've been caused to be crucified to the world. The world's been caused to be crucified to me. I've been made anew in Christ And because those realities are true, I'm not boasting about anything but Him. And that serves as our motive for ministering and serving the body of Christ. Okay. I've been trying to leave enough time to get to this last point. I had considered making it its own sermon, uh, but I think we've, we've got time to at least at what I think are the important parts here in verse 16. So in verse 16, Paul pronounces a blessing. Those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. I've translated it this way. It's a little more clunky in terms of reading it, but I think it emphasizes a couple of important things. Those who, walk, who by this rule will walk, peace be upon them. And mercy, in addition, upon the Israel of God. So Paul pronounces peace upon those who would walk according to this rule. What's the rule? Well, from the preceding verses, the rule is this. I'm not boasting about anything but Christ. It's exalting Christ only. Those who will walk by that, by that measuring stick, those who will walk by that, Paul says, peace, peace be upon them. I think Paul knows the tribulations that will come to those who will walk according to that measuring stick. Christ only exalted. And so he he pronounces a blessing of peace upon them and mercy in addition upon what group? The Israel of God. Now the question here is, who is the Israel of God? Uh, Quite a number of folks have said through through the years, popular teaching that the Israel of God here is just another descriptive term for the church, for believers in general. Uh, And some have even used this this passage to to propose what, what might be known as a replacement theology where the church replaces Israel. So God's moving along with Israel, all the plans for them, all the the promises to them, but they fall short. So God kind of scraps that project and he moves forward to the church and that the church replaces Israel. I don't think the scriptures bear out that kind of teaching. And so I wouldn't say here that the Israel of God is just a synonym for the church. Uh, I think the Israel of God, let me show you what what I think Paul is saying here and then I'm going to point you to Um, Romans chapter 11 to prove it, okay? Here's what I think Paul is getting at here. The mercy, mercy upon the Israel of God. I know this is kind of lengthy. Don't worry about writing it down. Just kind of get your mind around this. I think Paul ultimately knows the Jewish opposition to the cross. And that, that, 
he's even seeing there lived out in Galatia. This Jewish opposition to the cross ultimately has been ordained of God and for the benefit of the Gentiles. He recognizes it will not always be this way. It is now, but it will not always be this way. And so Paul desires and proclaims mercy upon the Israel that belongs to God and that will one day know and confess Jesus the Christ. We've referred back through Galatians, we've referred back to Romans a number of times because the themes in Galatians, Paul expands on in great detail a lot of times in Romans. So where else has Paul asked for mercy upon Israel or the Israel that belongs to God? Where else has he asked for this? And you see it in Romans 11. If we had time, really the thing to do would be to read Romans 9 through 11, but we don't. So let me just kind of point you to the concluding remarks, chapter 11, starting in verse, 23, uh, verse 25. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. So there it is again, no self-exaltation so that you won't be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. It's not, it's not fully, completely, and totally upon the, the Israelites or the people of Israel or the Jewish people. It's a partial hardening. There are still those Jewish folks who are coming to confess Christ alone as the Messiah. But in a bigger picture, a partial hardening has happened to Israel why? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Whether that's the fullness in terms of a number or the fullness of time for the Gentiles, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel, all the Israel that belongs to God will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Verse 28. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. The Galatians were, were seeing this firsthand. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. So also, these now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they may now be shown, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience that he may show mercy to all. And if you're trying to get your mind around this, so is Paul. Look at verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. I think Paul is recognizing in the bigger picture this opposition to the gospel from the Jewish folks is ordained of God for a season for the benefit of the Gentiles, but one day God will renew a redeeming work amongst them in such a way that those who are His, who belong to Him, He will call out of this world and reconcile them unto Himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I think Paul has that in mind when he says, mercy upon the Israel that, that belongs to God, those who are, those who are His. So it's interesting that although Paul has taken these teachers to task over and over again in this letter, ultimately he adopts a position of mercy toward the people. Okay, well let's pause there. We'll pick back up with verses 17 and 18 next week and also do just a little bit of general review. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you would help us as we serve you, um, to serve with the right motives. And Father, there are, there are times when we would confess that, that we don't, that, that our heart is motivated by pride or by some desire for self-preservation, 
But Father, I pray that you would help to shape and fashion and mold our hearts in such a way that our serving you would be only to boast in Christ and to proclaim his great name and salvation. And Father, we ask that you would help us in this, in Christ's name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we, uh, as we finish today. Blessed assurance.